Hey everybody, it's Alexander Williamson here with The Secret History Living in Your Aquarium. Uh, we are getting back to basics here on the channel, and we are going to be doing a video series called Secret Gems of the Aquarium Hobby, or Overlooked Gems of the Aquarium Hobby. We're going to be talking about plants, animals, fish, invertebrates, whatever it may be, that are really inexpensive, under five bucks in the US, uh, you know, four pounds, something like that, uh, or five euros. And we're going to talk about the biological history, how they were discovered, who discovered them, what they're related to, any other interesting tidbits and trivia, and all the basic care info. So it's kind of a deep dive species spotlight. But today we're kicking it off with the black phantom tetra. So let's go inside and take a look at a new group I just acquired of the beautiful Hyphesobricon Megalopterus or the Black Phantom Tetra. Ah, uh, nice and toasty. Now we're inside and we can take a look at this marvelous little fish. So coming to the front center right for us on cue, we have the Hyphesobricon uh, Megalopterus, which is the black phantom tetra. Now, I really love this fish. Like I said, it's affordable and it's often overlooked. And while we talk about its biological history and its history in the hobby, I also just want to film the fish interacting and hanging out in the aquaria with a group of other all sorts of other fish. They get along great uh, in a community tank, and these ones have only been in here for about 24 hours, so I think it'll be fun just to sit back and watch them. So, sorry there's no amazing graphics, but we'll just hang out and watch these fish as I tell you this story. So, again, the Hyphosobricon megalopterus is Greek from meaning large, uh, fin, and then the Hyphosobricon, or the genus name, means small in stature. The, the Hyphosobricon genus is full of tetra, and they are all under about three inches, so they're all smaller size tetra, and you know a lot of them. They are well-known tetra that they have evolved alongside. And their genus can be found all the way from central Mexico all the way to southern Argentina. So they have a huge range and they're very adaptable as a genus in general. Now, out of the genus, there are 156 known and described species, probably more than that out there still. And some of the most well-known species include the Ember Tetra, the Buenos Aires, Black Neon, the Red Line Tetra, Lemon Tetras, Flame Tetras, uh, and the Bleeding Heart Tetra, just to name a few others. So they come from a pretty diverse group of fish. And they were discovered in 1915 by a gentleman named Carl H. Eigenman, and he was a German-American ichthyologist that a lot of people may not have heard of, but he is actually one of the most prolific ichthyologists of the 20th century, and he accomplished a whole lot of work for American ichthyology and for the world at large as well. He and uh, Innes, as well as Schultz, um, the, they were some of the big names of the time of the early uh, 20th century up until the mid 20th century. Now, he also had a wife named Rose uh, Smith Eigman, and they were both into ichthyology. She was a zoology uh, professor, and they both taught school at Indiana University. Uh, together, uh, they described 195 genera and nearly 610 species of fish throughout North and South America. Especially notable uh, amongst the work that Carl did were his published papers on the freshwater fish of South America and North America, and specifically the evolution of traits and uh different little systems on each fish or each group of fish 
that evolve within cave systems. And he actually came up with a new uh, arm of evolutionary biology that today is kind of taken for granted as something we think of. But at the time, uh, his thoughts on it and his excellent documentation of it in a five-volume work uh, was pretty groundbreaking. He looked at these cave tetras found throughout Mexico and Central America, and he found uh, different versions of the fish living out in the open waters near the caves, and then he would compare the traits of the fish in the caves. And there were these archipelagos, so to speak, of or chains of the caves along rivers and throughout different countries and regions. And each area had differently evolved traits in the fish for different survival strategies. And yet they all evolved uh, a lack of eyesight and a lack of pigmentation as well as other things. So he was able to demonstrate this convergent evolution, which, uh, you know, at this point, evolution is only a defined uh, <laughs> concept for around 50 years uh, and been around for maybe a hundred, uh, if you count before Darwin, that some naturalists sort of had an inclination what was going on. But in 1908, he published, uh, the first of these works and he had a concept of regressive evolution, which is when a, uh, fish or any sort of animal really, uh, loses some of the traits that it has evolved and decides that it doesn't need them. It doesn't need the eyesight in the caves. It's able to maybe evolve a different sense. And so by studying a lot of the fish in this genus, the Hyphus sobricon, sorry guys on the pronunciation, um, he was able to illustrate this really beautifully to the world. So uh, the story of these fish being discovered in 1915 by him are all kind of part of that same uh, evolutionary biology lineage and uh, the notations on these fish uh, are pretty extensive and you can go back and take a look at them which is great. You know, a lot of times the European ichthyologists get all the credit and we don't see a ton from the American ones uh, early in the hobby. Now, this guy was well distinguished. He was the uh, curator at the Carnegie Museum and Aquarium in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania from 1909 to 1918. And his five volume series of the uh, American Charisidae um, is arguably probably the most significant work up to its time in the study of small tetras and fish in North and South America. And his regressive or degenerative evolution theory uh, definitely was the talk of the field at the time. Now, the phantom tetra, back to our subject at hand, is native to a rather large area. It's native to uh, several different rivers in uh, Paraguay and the upper uh, Madeira Basin, and including Guapore, Mamore, Beni, and uh, Brazil, as well as Bolivia and the Pantanal. Uh, the Pantanal is one of the most diverse aquatic uh, plant ecosystems in the world, if not the most, with over 280 species of plants found in that ecosystem alone, in that river system. And if you want to take good care of these fish, uh, it should reflect that diversity of plants. They love weaving in and out of the plants. They're egg scatterers, but they also uh, kind of scatter their eggs amongst plants oftentimes. Uh, they don't necessarily stick them to plants always, but they uh, will scatter them and uh, use the plants as cover for uh, predatory fish staying out of the area and so forth. So it makes them feel safe to have a lot of cover in the tank, and if you want to do some sort of biotope or whatnot, uh, it's a chance where you can actually have 
a ton of plants because like I said, there are 280 species of plants native to the Pantanal underwater alone. So pretty amazing. Now, the other cool thing about the Pantanal is that it has a pretty wide range of temperatures from the wet season to the dry season. And the water actually uh, that these fish are found in, uh, in that region can go all the way down to 68 degrees Fahrenheit or around 19 or 20 Celsius and all the way up to around 84 Fahrenheit. So they're pretty flexible. They can be in a colder uh, tropic aquarium or more of a tempid aquarium, or they can be in a full-on tropical tank with the other species like angelfish that enjoy those tropical temperatures. Uh, they tend to live in acidic waters that have a low TDS and a pH somewhere between 5 and 6.5 in the wild. Uh, however, because of that ability to uh, survive the rainy season in the Pantanal and other uh, grassland regions of their range, uh, these fish have evolved to also be able to tolerate uh, in captivity and when they're bred in farms, uh, more neutral water all the way up to around 7.5, even with a little bit of hardness up to around 250 or 300 parts per million TDS. If you want to breed them, however, you generally do need to have that 5.0 to 6.0 uh, acidic water, and you want to add tannins and have the environment basically pretty well, pretty low lit, uh, because all the plants and everything that they're used to in their natural habitat. Now, they also love tannins, and so you can set them up in a black water tank if you want, and when you do that, their colors, which on the males are an iridescent blue, and on the females ends up being this uh, subtle red color on the fins, uh, really, really shows off well in a dim light. It, it almost kind of defies uh, logic in that it, it, they seem brighter sometimes in a dark tank than in a uh, well-lit tank just because they use that reflective light in their iridophoric scales so well. Here you can kind of see they've come to the front just at a good time and you can see that's not blue pigmentation or anything that's just uh, a shimmery scale look that they're getting and the more they eat high protein and carotenoids as well as athentaskin and uh, other uh, omega-3s and omega-6 fatty acids, the better they will look that way, the more vivid they will be. So feeding them live food, uh, live baby brine shrimp and you know mosquito larvae, things like that, the better they will look. Now they will eat flake food easily, which makes them another re another reason why they're a great fish to keep. Uh, but like I said, if you've got baby brine shrimp or black worms, blood worms, Daphnia, or any sort of little microfauna, that's what they're going to really uh, thrive off of and do super well. Uh, they're a really good community species because they only reach an inch long or so. Uh, what you're seeing now is their very max length. And if you take a look, you know, at my hand size here, uh, you can see that they are pretty small little fish. Now, the other cool thing about them is unlike a lot of other tetras, boy, this betta is just going to town on them. Uh, unlike a lot of other uh, tetras, they are able to be very happily found in shoals of only four or five fish. So you don't need a giant school of eight, nine, ten, a dozen for them to be happy. Uh, they're naturally found in these smaller breakaway shoals, and they act just as dynamically. Uh, the males tend to uh, have a fin that they show off, hence you know their Greek name having that attribute named in it. And the males will put up their fin, much like this one right here is doing, and they will have competitions for who has the best fin as well as the best reflective markings, whereas the females will uh, have more of a show-and-tell where they show off the redness or red iridescence in their 
uh, fins, including their dorsal, caudal, pelvic, and um, adipose fin, whereas the adipose fin on the males is not too prominent. That's that little fin in between uh, the tail and the dorsal fin up top. But again, you can see that kind of spade-shaped flare that they get to that fin when they're excited. And I'm filming now in the morning, early morning, and so they are awake and they oftentimes kind of joust, the different males joust for position in the tank. And that position changes day to day by who is dominant, who's in the best shape, and who looks the best. And uh, when they're spawning, it's a really fun part of keeping this fish. It's just that they're an active fish that puts on a display in the mornings and again in the nights. Uh, and then midday, oftentimes, they'll kind of lay low and hide amongst all the plants and things. Now, the best food that you can feed them for this activity, this energy, and the color displays is going to be live. But frozen food comes in a close second. You can feed them, you know, blood, blood worms, Daphnia, that sort of thing. And, um, you know... At the end of the day, if you can only feed them flake food or dry granule type foods, that's actually fine too. It's just a little bit harder to spawn them if uh, if that's your goal without live food. Now, if you do want to spawn them, the best way, uh, since they're an egg scatterer that doesn't take care of their young, just like pretty much um, all tetras in, the, in this genus, is to separate the males and females for about 10 or 15 days and put them in separate little tanks, feed them the high protein diets with live food because it's, it really gets their instincts and their, uh, their natural uh, vigor going. And you feed them a high protein diet of that live food and then uh, you want to gently reduce the TDS in the tank by doing water changes, as well as you can slowly bump the acidity down by adding dried leaves. And once the acidity is down below around 6.2 or 6.5, arguably, they will then be in spawning condition. So the other little signal, other than just feeding them live uh, baby brine or other types of live food is they want to know that their babies will have food to eat. So it's important to also put in some leaf litter and uh, while you're conditioning them to get ready to spawn and let biofilms kind of develop on that leaf litter, which will then be a food source of uh, paramecium and infusoria for the babies, which is what the babies will eat for the first uh two to four weeks uh, after they've kind of consumed their yolk sac. Now the eggs hatch really quickly and they're very teeny with the females being able to lay up to 300 eggs at a time. So uh, they will get eaten and they will get lost very quickly in a community tank. You really need to put them in their own breeding tank and in a tank where they can't get to those eggs because just like most tetras, they will eat the eggs if they see them again. So if they land on a leaf or if they land on, you know, open sand or gravel uh, that's flat, they'll, they'll go down and eat it later in the day, whereas... Uh, if you use marbles or other um, screens for the eggs to fall down through in a set, specially set up breeding tank, then you can actually get pretty good numbers of these things breeding and that keeps the price down, honestly. Uh, the fact that they have that many babies, that many eggs. So after two to four weeks, the best thing to feed is, uh, you know, brine shrimp or Daphnia and then you can just start feeding them flake food. This is really an underrated fish in a lot of ways. You know, they've been cheap, just like the black neon tetra or the, uh, you know, any of the neon tetras. Uh, and oftentimes bleeding heart tetras or the Von Rio uh, or Buenos Aires get kind of the limelight a little bit more because these guys aren't full of different colors, but they're a really peaceful fish, and like I said, they shoal in those smaller groups, 
And they have kind of a cool backstory um, helping shape our understanding of evolution and uh, the story of the whole Tetra genus and species grouping as a whole. So they get along great, you know, with angelfish, Corydora, other Tetras. Um, you can see the other kinds of fish that are in here. Live bears and guppies are fine as well, too. Um, and at the end of the day, I think that everybody should give these fish a shot. You know, especially if you have a lot of other colorful fish, they really do provide kind of a nice break from that. And there's kind of a refined and elegant beauty. They're almost like rainbow fish or um, or the, uh, the darter tetras uh, in the way they show off their finnage and they, you know, dance around the tank. So that is what I have to say about these lovely fish, but I hope uh, that you guys will give them a shot, and I hope to talk to you next time on a overlooked gem species spotlight. If you like this, please hit that like button and uh, let me know in the comments if you've kept these fish, you have any other tips or tricks or thoughts, or you have a variation like a long fin variety or a different color variety from captivity, you know, the albino ones and things. Uh, I'd love to hear about that as well. And if you want to support the channel and these deeper dives into the different species we know and love, uh, you can become a member for only a buck ninety nine and get a lot more access backstage to all the stuff that I'm up to and the sources I use, as well as more input on what the channel is up to. All right, guys, I will talk to you later. This was Alex with the secret history living in your aquarium. Bye, guys.